Luke 23 as from verse 26. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? To others, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. And, and when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Brothers and sisters, our text in this part of scriptures that we have read is verse 20, uh, 42 and 43. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Beloved brothers and sisters, many people, when they hear about the conversion of this dying criminal on the cross, think about God's long-suffering, patience with sinners. And they think about that point alone. They sometimes say, I may be a criminal, because even this criminal was saved at the last moment. I may repent later, because this criminal repented only at the end of his life. But both these statements are ridiculous. The first statement may be used to justify criminal sin because one may repent later. The second statement may be used to delay repentance. But there is no way of knowing that there would be an opportunity later on in life to repent. Although it is quite true that God may save the sinner at the very last moment, that is not the only point in this part of the scripture. In, re in relation to this criminal, 
let us consider the way we received his faith. But secondly, the worth of his faith. Thirdly, the wage of his faith. And fourthly, the warranty won by his faith. First, let us consider the way he received faith. Do we have any idea how this man received his faith? He certain, certainly did not attend a sermon there at the cross. There was no worship service or a special prayer for him. All we know is that he was a criminal who committed such a serious crime that it justified the death penalty. But yet, he became a sincere, repentant believer of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit works in mysterious ways. Earlier, Jesus said to Nicodemus, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. John 3 verse 8. Clearly, the Holy Spirit worked mightily in this sinner's heart at that specific moment where he was hanging next to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit opened this wretched man's eyes to see the Lord Jesus as his Savior. God may have used the events that took place while Jesus was carrying his cross on the way to Gol Golgotha, the skull, as it is translated, there on the Via Dolorosa, the road full of pain. Perhaps this man heard Jesus say to the women of Jerusalem, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, weep for yourselves and for your children. He probably saw the compassion in Jesus' eyes when he looked at these women. He probably had not seen something like this ever before in his life. He probably saw Jesus fainting under the weight of that cross that he had to carry. And they gave that cross then to Simon of Cyrene. Were all these things perhaps the first part of God's sermon to this wretched man? Did the Holy Spirit in this way soften man's heart? that was hardened through sin. This criminal probably witnessed how Jesus' executioners laid him on the cross. Jesus did not swear at his executioners or resist his execution. When the executioners brought their hammers and drove nails through his hands, nailing him to that wood. The criminal probably saw Jesus' suffering while he himself was suffering excruciating pain. The criminal probably expected Jesus to say, Father, consume these soldiers with fire. But to his probable astonishment, he heard Jesus pray to his father, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus interceded for his executioners. And all the people who sought his life, all the people who shouted, crucify him. It is as if Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them and all sinners who shall repent and believe the gospel 
Because that is why I am on this cross, Father. The prophet Isaiah said of Jesus, For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah 53 verse 12. Jesus was busy with his mission on earth. Was this perhaps the second part of God's sermon to this man? We don't know. But what we do know is that Jesus acted as a mediator between God the Father and sinners. We also do know that God showed mercy to this wretched man next to Jesus on the cross. When his executioners raised this cross to which this criminal was lay, nailed and planted it upright in the soil, he probably saw this inscription above Jesus' cross, written in three languages, Aramic, Hebrew, Greek and Latin, the three main languages spoken at the time. And the inscription said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. God intended this inscription as a declaration of who Jesus really was. Despite his seeming humiliation and disgrace, the chief priests went to Pilate and protested to him, saying, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. John 19 verse 21 and 22. Jesus is the king of the Jews. Jesus is the king of the church. Pilate proclaimed it in three world languages so that everyone could read and understand it. Perhaps these words, if the criminal did read those words, were his Bible. And perhaps he said to himself, this man next to me is called the king of the Jews. Perhaps this man knew the prophecy in Isaiah 53 verse 3 and 4. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment was brought, has brought us peace. That brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, wounds we are healed. Looking at the people around the cross, the criminal could see the people hating and sneering and hissing at Jesus. Did the Holy Spirit open this man's eyes and heart to realize that God was fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy so many centuries ago right before his eyes? The enemies of Jesus shouted, he saved others. These were pure gospel from the lips of the haters of Jesus Christ. He saved others. This man saved others. He can save me too. Do we know the way of this dying criminal's conversion? Yes. Once again, yes. The people shouted, he saved others. Yes, Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. He said so himself. 
He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. John 14 verse 6. Jesus is the way. May the Lord save everyone today who hears this word. Glory to God. Glory to Jesus Christ. The King of the Jews. The King of all people who believe in Him. He is the way to the Father. But secondly, let's look at the worth of his faith. The dying criminal came to faith while seeing his dying Savior. Amazingly, and it's truly amazing, he called Jesus Lord. According to the New King James Version of the Bible, he confessed that Jesus would shortly come into his kingdom. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus hung on a cross, bleeding to death, suffocating by the mere weight of his body on his arms, tearing his muscles of his chest apart, seemingly helpless. But this man, could see beyond the suffering and beyond the suffocation of a sinless man. He sought kingdom and Jesus as the king. No flesh and blood revealed this to this criminal. Earlier when Peter became the first confessing Christian saying to Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Matthew 16, verse 16 and 17. Where the Apostle Peter became the first confessing Christian before Jesus' crucifixion, this nameless criminal hanging next to Jesus became the first confessing Christian after Jesus' crucifixion. The Holy Spirit revealed this to him. What amazing grace! The criminal on the cross believed in Jesus as a time, at a time when all the other disciples had left him. Judas betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver and then he killed himself. At Jesus' arrest, all the disciples had fled into the darkness of night. That same night, Peter disowned Jesus with curses on his tongue. Three times. Here at the cross, the women stood far off looking at the spectacle from a distance. But this criminal nevertheless called Jesus Lord. And he spoke of a kingdom. How remarkable, how wondrous, brothers and sisters. Remember that this criminal was a tortured, crucified, dying man. Can one ever imagine that a dying man could expect or even hope that another dying man on a cross next to him could save him? Is it humanly, humanly possible for someone to display such first-class faith at such a terrifying time? In human terms, one cannot measure the worth of this criminal's faith in the Son of God. In his sovereignty, God gave this sinner his firm faith. There is no other explanation for the worth of this man's faith. Note his humility. He did not ask to be seated next to Jesus in his kingdom like the two sons of Zebedee who earlier had asked Jesus to be seated on the two sides of him. 
he simply asked, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He had nothing to lay before Christ. He had nothing that he himself could rely on. It is like the words of the tax collector in the parable who said, God, be merciful upon me, a sinner. Luke 18 verse 13. Remember me. Jesus previously said to his disciples, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16 verse 16. The criminal on the cross believed, but he was not baptized. Baptism, however, is only a sign and a seal of God's covenant with believers. Here, with this disgraced man at death's door, the Lord personally promised this person of eternal life. This morning, brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus through his word says to you and to me, believe and you shall live. That is the worth of his faith, of our faith, sealed through our baptism, if we had been baptized. The worth of our faith is not ourselves, it is the blood and the body of Jesus Christ on the cross. Our salvation does not depend on us or anything that we have done or that we could place before God. Thank God for it. Jesus is the worthy lamb for he was slain and has redeemed us to God by his blood. Revelation 5 verse 9 He is the worth of our faith. But let's look at Thirdly, the wage of his faith. God had told Adam in paradise, the first paradise, that if he ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he would surely die. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life with Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6 verse 23. This nameless criminal was nailed to the cross because of his crime, his sin. When he rebuked the other criminal for railing, mocking Christ, he said, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? What a confession. God condemns sin, and the wages of sin is death. That is why they were hanging on the cross. And he said, we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. What a confession. He confessed his faith in the Lord Jesus as openly as it was possible there on the cross. He rebuked the other criminal. He confessed his faith at the most trying time of his entire life. Because it's easy for us here in church, brothers and sisters, to confess our faith and to confess our sin where there is no pressure, no pain. But to confess your faith when under torture and tribulation is humanly impossible. One cannot, can only do so if God miraculous mercy gives one that faith the apostle Paul wrote in Romans 10 verse 9 if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead you will be saved you must openly confess that like this man and then you can Belief in your heart that God will raise you from the dead. Now where the wages of sin is death, 
the wages of life of our faith is life someone who gets the wages of faith will rebuke others who dance at door at death's door if you don't rebuke sin then you become an accomplice to sin a believer confesses his sin this man said in three words we indeed justly death is the just wages for our sin one can hardly imagine a more sincere confession of sin than these three words of a dying man a believer also bears witness for Jesus this man said to the other criminal this man has done nothing wrong what a strong statement of faith Jesus is the sinless Savior who has paid for the sin of the world a faithful person also prays this criminal prays to the Lord just remember Jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom others mocked Jesus seeming inability to save himself but this criminal believed that Jesus would live and rule and he wanted to be part of Jesus's kingdom may we pray brothers and sisters to Jesus as the main part of our thanksgiving to him Psalm 50 verse, verse 14 may we want to enter Jesus's kingdom so that we can always worship him as Lord and as King lastly let's consider the warranty won by his faith Jesus said to him truly I tell you today you will be with me in paradise Jesus promised eternal life to this criminal and in so doing did exactly what the other criminal sneeringly asked Jesus when he said are you not Christ save yourself and us that was not a prayer this unrepentant mocking criminal was condemned but Jesus promised this humble faithful praying criminal that he would be saved to a life in paradise Jesus used the word truly truly he is the faithful witness the Amen Amen means it shall be true and certain it is as if Jesus put the Amen to this repenting criminals prayer truly he warns him life in paradise Jesus warrants eternal life to us when we humbly pray for forgiveness of sin truly you shall be with me in paradise that is our warranty